We have Shabbos, Parash the Savoy, Ki Savoy, El Haaretz, when you go into the land. What do you do? You bring the first fruits. You offer mitzvah bikurim. And I thought I'd just, while people just settle their pots and pans, maybe I'll just read what I wrote about. Thank you. Who's coming? Sean! Wow, good to see you. Preparing for Rosh Hashanah, what do you recognize first and foremost when you decide what's king in our lives? You have to decide to be the king in your life. You have to recognize blessed is the first fruit, that it's all about you. Bishvili nivra ha'ilam, the Rebbe insists that we, we know and apply to ourselves and take it seriously. It's such a provocative statement. The whole world was created for me. Welcome, Yael, good Arab Shabbos. The whole world was created for me. What, it seems like the opposite message that the most spiritualists have been saying for the past million years. Just make yourself bittal. It's all about bittal. And the Rebbe speaks about bittal at length. It's all about nullifying yourself. The question is, what do you nullify yourself to? If there's only Hashem, and your lowercase ani, your self, sense of self, has to, has to be one with the uh, infinite consciousness. So that's, that's just uh, the anaychi. When you add the chaf, the kesser, you put the crown on, on you, you recognize that you're the, that the world was created for you. When you make that identity move from whatever it was before that to something that, that says, you know what? We're partners in this together. You, you, me, and Bestie. We're partners in this together because the, the entering in the land is considered... Um, they were transforming the seven nations by... Even if it came to it, they were prepared to go to war preemptively. If they didn't submit, kneel take the knee. <laughs> if they didn't do that, they, they, they would. So, this war is considered not obligatory. The war, the general idea of going out to war as the model for uh, spiritual, uh, the, to understand your role in the world as a, that has a spiritual mi mission. Um, you actually sent yourself into very finite mortal consciousness in order to reflect that it's not just a string of random arbitrary binary code or some evil AI creating your universe, but you in effect creating your own world because you were in, its, in your source, in your Godhead, when, you, when all souls link up to the First desire, the mean the, nimilach, the, who did Hashem consult with? God consulted with the souls of the Jewish people to decide to create the world. That, make, whoops, that makes us have a kind of precedence. Of, um, the Bikurim, the first fruit, is uh, representing that. Good Shabbos, Yael. I'm just reading your reading again. So I'm going to read this. So I could just chill out because who wants to give a share? I, I, I wanted to for bring last night. It didn't happen. I tried. Um, so yeah, I'm, I've been giving sure and that's been, been more in the place. So here I'm just going to read this and then if we get into a share later, good. And if we get into a conversation, even better. If someone's going to say Lachayim, I'll join you. So Chayel, well, I didn't really get to bring with you, and that's upsetting, but I gave a share, which was almost as good, hopefully. So, <clears throat> what to me, I took out of it the highest of level. 
is the spinal column, which gives life from the mind to the, the body, the, the nervous system. That's high yellow. It's the recognition of there was someone worthy simply because he was an authentic person. He loved other people. Baal Shem Tov. <clears throat> he was born on this day and therefore his mission became something tangible in the world. Welcome. Shabbos to you, Karim. Chaim. Welcome, Heidi. Welcome, Tracy. Good to see you. Chaim. So let me dramatize this for you so I can have some fun. And I don't fall asleep. First, it's about you. This is one of my most rushed articles that I ever wrote, so if it sucks, uh, whatever. I tried. The world was created for you, the Jewish people. When we are grateful for what we have been blessed with, we celebrate openly before Hashem. I think I wrote about this, maybe in this article, that there's a mitzvah to proclaim, you have to say this liturgy as, as you offer these first fruits that God blessed you with. And the Rebbe said that this is meant to indicate a spirit that they had in doing this mitzvah, which was one of being so grateful that you just have to Thank God openly in front of all of your other friends that are coming around from other parts of the world. All pil pilgriming with all the fruits laden. And uh, the rich people would build, bring their finest gold and silver trays to, to display it on. And they would be led, because of the, the, the joy that they had, they would be led to express it verbally. There's a lot of emphasis on communication and uh, just talking in Kabbalah and Hasidus, I find. It's a, it's a miser ikr, but that's not what's talked about mostly. Most talk, mostly we speak about the power of speech. And what I'm reading, okay. Makshava nobody talks about anymore. That's the next phase, we're, we're working towards that. We have to want it first. If you want it, the spaghetti inside your skull will be fit for it to really understand it well and apply it and make it relevant. I had a discussion with someone just the other day um, about um, the distaste or disinterest rather in, in using their mind in an intellectual way, particularly in terms of just learning tarot, not something that they were interested in. But this person was very visceral and expressive, um, like into dance and yoga and all that and is, a, is, is an emotional person and uh, affected, which is, I'm not saying that in a good way. And there's something in the abstract that bores people that may be more visceral. So my answer was the whole point of having the whole pathway, this gateway of an intellectual exercise, for example, meditation, is meant to bring out a visceral experience. So you have to talk about that. And in order to do that, you might have to say a few words of Torah, a few words of Torah in um, the process. So you gotta pay attention just for that. If you're just naturally born with it, you don't have to lecture a child too much. If you're just naturally in tune, it's just easier for you. In the olden days, they didn't have to spend much time preparing to say Shema, they would say Shema, they would, melt all the, uh, the different layers of the universe into, into one, recognizing the unity of Hashem and everything. And that would be it. And they'd go on with their day, which is probably a lot of this learning all day long. That's what they did. So again, the title just is, first, it's about you. Chosen people may seem like an audacious title for a nation so persecuted throughout history. Yet we are all promised consolation for all the tragedy and hardship. Good Shabbos. All the tragedy and hardship we've suffered. A world of eternal peace, of reward and prosperity awaits each Jew. And the Rebbe insists that this redemption is unfolding now before our eyes. Ultimately, the most spectacular victory will be celebrated, not in some distant heaven, but specifically in the material world. God's dirabatachtainim, period. In simple terms, this means that each Jew will be incredibly wealthy and earnestly grateful. It will be natural for Jews to sing God's praise 
openly in public. This describes the mitzvah of Bikurim. The first fruits are brought to Yerushalayim, Jerusalem, to the base of Mignash, the holy temple, and presented to the Kohanim, Lachayim to you too. So they were presented to the Kohanim. All those who make this joyous pilgrimage stay the night. The holy city fills with vibrant people celebrating their success with gratitude. The Rebbe emphasizes how Bikurim teach us how infinity, infinite success and gratitude, Chaim, can be experienced within every speck of life, to quote. The first fruits, Bikurim, must be brought before Hashem, your Lord, laden in vessels. It was the custom of the rich to bring their Bikurim in containers of silver or gold, whereas the poor made baskets of inexpensive organic materials. The law is that when Bikurim are presented in vessels, I better shut the door. When Bikurim are presented in vessels made of precious metals, the Kayan takes the Bikurim and the vessels are returned to the owner. But if Bikurim are brought in baskets of willow, reeds, or the like, then these fr- fruits go to the Kohanim, the priests, along with the containers. The Kayan get to keep the chachkalach that they make to hold the fruits in. The baskets and, and, and the elk and its ilk, I don't know, whatever accoutrements go along with that. The virtue of the Jewish people being the first fruit, Bikurim, is most pronounced when they embody the symbol of selection, of being chosen, the first fruits. That is, when Jews are recognized as Bikurim, the best, even as they exist as normal people in the world, in their very mortal veneer, a kind of vessel, a body that contains, even restricts, a soul. So that's the analogy of bringing them these first fruits in a vessel shows you that your body becomes sanctified too, even if it's a poor man's offering. My question, of course, is the corollary. What about the rich guy? He's rejected? Or does he become like the Kayan and therefore he can enjoy his own possessions? He's like a Kayan. He gets to keep the vessels, his body actually goes, he takes it home with him and celebrates as if he's the Kayan. The rich person in that sense, I think, is like a Kayan. The soul is a treasure trove of wealth, yet the restrictive confining body, which includes the personality, doesn't always reflect that wealth. It may seem the pauper who simply lacks resources, but the poor man reaches deeper and adds ingenuity of design and craftsmanship to produce vessels, beautiful baskets to contain the first fruits. These simple vessels are thus elevated to the sanctity of Ikurim, the best, to be enjoyed by the Kohanim, agents of the Shekhinah, God's presence. The only thing that holds us back from realizing this promise of success and wealth is, does anyone want to guess that one? What's holding us back for wealth? What would Tony Robbins say? Is there any Tony Robbins or Zig Ziglar? What would he say about that? They always say that you're due, it's the same message. Lahabdil, it's the same message, right? You are a warrior, you're a successful person. Isn't that what people jog to these days when they're listening in their Walkman? They're listening to being told that you are everything and therefore what's holding you back? You have the key, the Rebbe says. So here, what's holding us back is, drum roll please. Da'as. You connect to something. If that something included Tara and God, then you will be sure to experience that success, particularly in the way of engaged religious experience. It will be something that's visceral, not cerebral only. Cerebral might be the pathway to get there, but it's meant to be visceral. You're meant to feel ecstasy to be alive. Chayim to you. The Gurim is the celebration of life. You just say, there is a concept of the first fruits of being worthy, being found worthy, and therefore presented in such a, with such grandeur. That is actually meant to embody your identity, who you are, who is your core. Okay, that in mind. So, there's, so the thing that's holding you back is 
Das, our presence of mind in living with this deep truth. The deep truth of what someone is really, what's coming to them. What is coming to you? Is it something good or something foreboding? Here we're saying it's the wealth of the universe. So, our, so what's holding us back is our presence of mind in living with this deep truth. There is no poverty, our sages teach, other than in mind. Ain ani elabadas. Poorness is expressed most in your mindset. Once you have a wealthy mindset and you don't have fruit flies disturbing you, when you have that, I guess you'd have your own fly swatter guy. Amongst other, other things. So when you have the das of who you are and therefore what, what you're capable of, you tap into true wealth and success because God, you in your Godhead, decided that you're going to succeed in this war. That's kisavai. You kitate say we discussed before when you go out to war, what happens when you win and you come into your land that you now inherit. that becomes the reward for all the work that you did in the trenches. This deep truth is embedded within the mitzvah of the Kurim. Now, it's just quotes of the Rebbe for the end. Even the simple vessel of a pauper is identifiable as the Kurim. If God has confidence in us, how dare we doubt? Even the word God implies that there's something that is separate from you. Godhead, I, I'm starting to see, is a much more effective term, and I hope it's not like the wrong religion. But Godhead expresses that there is the head and the tail of, of you. So when you connect the two and realize that your, the spine connects both polarities, that realization, the Rebbe calls uh, the chibur, the joining of das eli and das tachtai. When you and your maker agree, when you and your Godhead are thinking the same thing and care about each each uh, concern. The creator gets something out of it, and you and you as uh, the created, who you created, you're your own Frankenstein. <laughs> Even the simple vessels of a pauper are identifiable as bikurim. In fact, bikurim must be presented in vessels, indicating that it is by dint of the container, the vessel, that they reach the level of. Before God, your Lord, as Bikurim is said to be brought before God. Here meaning presented to the Kayan. Vessels made of even the simplest materials from the physical world, the lowest of all dimensions, become part of the Bikurim. To the extent that the Bikurim go to the Kahanim along with the containers, the vessel itself reaches the level of before God, your Lord. Being Bikurim, the first fruits, Jew, Jews are an end unto themselves. Everything is created for them. From this it is understood that every detail in a Jew's life, even those who have no obvious connection to Terah, every moment in time, every point in space, every single thought, word, or action has inherent purpose. And we are not a means to an end, an intermediary to something else. And that goes with every single moment in experience. That is to say that each instance is something entirely new in terms of the purpose of any given detail. It is thus obligatory to say, for my sake, for the sake of this detail, the Rebbe adds, the world was created. This moment, this detail in your life, the whole world was created for that, no matter how insignificant, like the uh, basket made out of reeds. All aspects of the world, every moment in time, etc., are thus included within a single moment. From this it is understood that the power to reach each day they, Terah and Mitzvahs, should be new in your eyes, I think that's Rashi, notwithstanding the fact that the person had done this Aveda, this work, prior to then, so even though there's a continuity between 
what you've done and what you're going to do, you're supposed to see that the moment is actually independent of that, that journey. The moment has inherent value. And sometimes your Veda is charged and sometimes you're resting from being charged before. No moment is judged except in context, but there is the proper, um, the best way to approach each moment. So each day they turn this should be new in your eyes, notwithstanding the fact that the person had done this Aveda prior to then, to then, is specifically within the power of a Jew, the first fruit, the Kurin. So this experience of the novelty of each moment is particular to Jews in some way. With regard to all worldly matters, since they are not an end unto themselves, other things in the world, just a means to an end for the sake of the Jewish people and for the sake of the Torah, it says the world was created. It is possible that a day, and how much more so a moment in time, can be a con continuation from the Aveda of yesterday, or a preparation, an intermediary, to tomorrow. Only Jews have the power to accomplish what they say, that each day they should be new in your eyes, a truly novel innovation following the model of the daily renewal each moment of creation ex nihilo through God Almighty himself. So the Rebbe says the fact that creation happens instantly every moment is the basis for the, the possibility of you to achieve eternity, eternity in a moment and in a grain of sand or whatever William Blake's talking about. So basically, it's a celebration of the moment, celebration of the success of, of you being the best you through whatever you're going through, good, bad, and uh, very bland is all equally important. That reminds me of what we said, I think it was this morning or yesterday, about how the prayer of Moses himself and the, every person is on par. That's how important it is, equally. So it seems expressive of the idea that there's a a Maisha Rabbeinu, a Nitzutz of, of Maisha, a spark of Maisha in every single person. The Nitzutz of Mashiach, because Maisha, the Gael Rishon, is Gael Achrein. Moses and the Messiah are one. It's just a new incarnation of the same soul. How did he get over from Levi to Yehuda? Save that for another chapter. I think I've spoke about it once, maybe. Chaim. So what's on people's minds? Illuminate me with, with uh, some reflection. Oh, I think y'all wrote something. People don't believe in themselves, but God does. Right, so that's where I got onto this whole Godhead uh, thing. But the Godhead basically says, why do you not, why do you doubt? Things are going to get better. There's probably a song about that. Um, it's getting better all the time. Better, better, better. You, you could decide every, every moment how you're going to interpret it. Okay, here's a good thing. We said that Chayel is all about the vitality. It's the spinal column that connects the vitality of your mind into the experience of your body. Chayel is, the, is the, the day that shows us that that's, that power exists. And therefore, Elul itself becomes this reflection of where did I put my vitality? Where is my Chayas? Where would I put it throughout the year? What, and, from Chayel on every single month, how did I do it? Yeah, how was I? Where was my, what did I live for? And what happens if you live for the right things? 
then you get a certain boost of chayim, of life. Let me. Just, I'm just going to read this one thing, and then we'll chill out a bit again. Even when Terah speaks about life, life force, as it says about Terah that it is our life and length of days, when you add more in your pursuit of true knowledge, then you gain in life added to you. The reason why Taira has this capacity to bring life to you is because when you're learning or, or if you're inspired in general, because there's a bond experience with God, the one who gives the author of the Torah, as it says explicitly in the Torah of Eschanan, Dalid, Dalid, 4.4, four, it says, and you who cleave to, the, to God your Lord, life to you today. Today, of course, is all about light. It's when it's illuminated for you that your life source is really one with the visceral, tangible experience of feeling whatever's good in your life, whatever source of life, it could be as simple as breathing, don't ever take that for granted, especially in our times. Um, something that simple is your direct connection to, to Hashem. Reflecting on that elicits in a person a state of vacus. He feels that his life force itself is something in, infinite. You're only basically taking what you can handle. The, this power keg that, you know, the coyote's uh, trail of, uh, what was it, the, the, the gunpowder to the power keg, is, is the Godhead, it's the ultimate reality of the infinity of, of the Creator. But when you cleave to that, when you think about that, when you feel that, that adds life, and you become Super X Man you. I realized recently that the S, Atbash, the total of Raz, is 73. Chochma, Hayom Yom. Chochma. Raz, secret is Chochma. So wisdom is... is is um, likened to light, and that illuminates the uh, secrets, the raz, the illusion. If you apply wisdom to even experience, as we said before about the decision, whether we're going to go back to Egypt when we were at uh, the, the Yam Suf, the Sea of Reeds, why did God put this obstacle in my path? It's meant for me to reflect on that. What is my Godhead, my soul's journey that what it, that it needs, or the, the author of that journey? Why did, he, did that happen? And, and they came up with the idea. There were three other opinions, of course, as we said at length. But they came up with the idea from that, that God wants us to return to Egypt to make the booty a little bit bigger. Shake, to take more spoils of war from, from Egypt from, or as restitution of some sort for all their, I think it was 86 years of enslavement. It wasn't 210, it wasn't 400, it wasn't 430. I think it was 86. The spine of Arya Kaplan points out there are 32 spinal nerves. Okay, then we have 18 and 32, which is Leib Masivas Chochmo. Candle lighting, good job. Thanks for tuning in, Heidi. Um, like there are 32 paths of wisdom. So you have the heart connected to the spinal column to show its role of giving life. That works. Aren't rainbows a reflection of the ultimate mikvah? Um, 
I never heard that. Because of, you're saying from, because of Noah, of Noah, Noah's Ark, you're saying, because it was a purification process, the 40 days of rain, the 40 saws of the mikvah, and it was that meant to purify the world, and therefore the sign afterwards is a promise of a greater cleansing. Okay, I like it. <laughs> you wrote that all in one little, uh, what are those things called, Emo emojis. Me neither, I was just reflecting. Okay, well you got it out of me too. <laughs> that is different and more positive take than I've ever heard before. On the rainbow thing, you mean? 725, I'm just gotta do some math, hold on. Not too bad. Probably time for one more brew, which gets a little faster than the first few sips. Chaim. Thank you, y'all. If I came up with something interesting, that would be cool. Okay, one more thing, I think. This is very important. We say that Tafshin and Aleph is like Tafshin Pei Aleph. 30 years later, the Rebbe says what applies then applies now. What was Nun Aleph? 5751, what was that? Nifloi Sereno, I'll show you one of this. What's this year? Ploi Sereno. 30 years later, it becomes the same thing without the Nun. I was trying to get an answer for why there's no Nun. But basically, it's the same thing. The Rabbi Ginsburg said as much, at least. In the future redemption, then Meisha's request will be fulfilled. Send with the one who will ultimately bring the Jewish people into the land forever. Mashiach himself, why send me? You don't want me, he's basically telling Hashem. As Rashi explains. Shemesha yegam goyalam la'asid. Shemesha, Meisha will be the future redeemer. So he actually, his prayer, his prayer was answered. He says, you send with, with, the, with the ultimate one. Don't send me, he's like, so ultimately, he will be the redeemer. We were going to have leaders in the in the first redemption. We had a leader. We had Moshe Rabbeinu, and he had brothers that were pretty impressive too, and a sister, brother and a sister that were pretty impressive. We had leaders, and that is what we are promised for the current redemption. Maishe Rabbeinu is the future redeemer because we are meant to be led by worthy leaders, the Chaim. By people that you look up to and everybody should look up to because they are inherently um, impressive guys or, and gals. The Gula Mitzrayim, Kim Yitzayitz, Kim Yitzayitz, Kim Yitzayitz, Gel Rishnu, Gel Acharein. The first redeemer is the last redeemer. Then the Rebbe says, V'yesh Lahoyer, Shlach Na, is Nunalef, Nifloi Serenu. That's why I think this applies to this year, because the Rebbe associates this Shlach Nabi Atishlach. Meishe Rabbeinu is going to be revealed in the world, in, at least in the sense that you're going to uh, realize um, the, that your the, your importance is just as important of Moshe Rabbeinu when you're, when you're davening. For, that was the example we had here today. And uh, therefore, you have the power to transform everything. Chai. Shabbos, everyone.